Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to BC314, our course on media and technology in ministry. Thank you each one for joining today, thank you for joining the class. Um, let's take a moment to pray and we will get started. Could somebody please lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for the class we are about to have. We thank you for the skills and talents that you have placed in us, Lord. And as we learn about this media and technology, God, I pray that you will help us to understand the things and use it in the right way, God, so that uh, we can glorify you uh, through this technology. We can use it for your kingdom, uh, for the expansion of your kingdom, Jesus. Be with us and guide us. Give us a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. We thank you for past trashes and I thank you for all my classmates over here. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. So the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been considering um, different areas where the church and the way we do ministry in the church has gone through several transitions. So we talked about the ministry of the Word of God, uh, the, 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 the way the, the Word is being preached, you call it preaching styles, or the way the preacher presents everything. We talked about the venue, how that has changed. Uh, we talked about worship, worship ministry, how that has changed. Uh, we also then um, talked about uh, creative arts or performing arts, how that has been useful and how that has evolved. Then we also talked about some aspects of, um, of media, the radio, television, and films, how that all, uh, how in those areas uh, things have uh, really evolved and served the, the church. Um, we want to cover one more set of um, things in uh, which uh, we, we just refer to as entertainment and gaming. So this is something more current. And uh, just to give us some perspective, and I realize that these are also areas where um, people are being involved and where ministry can happen. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And after that, in lesson number 11, we are going to change and, and move more towards um, the use of social media com and communication, social media, and then slowly start moving into other areas where the uh, technologies, media technology is being used, uh, and, and we'll, we'll get into those details. So first, let's just um, uh, talk about uh, entertainment and gaming. So this is another area. Um, where the entertainment, by entertainment we mean, you know, people want to relax, uh, they want to do something light, something fun, like recreation, just, you know, take your mind off work and take your mind off busyness and, and relax. So, uh, generally, you know, there'll be some form of entertainment. So, it's interesting to see, and it's good to see that, believers have provided good alternatives to what the world is offering. Right? So this form of entertainment or recreation, uh, we can see in terms of maybe exhibitions, maybe live entertainment, like, you know, you may have people who are doing stand-up comedies or things like that. And of course, you can have an entertainment that comes through media. Um, all of this takes you know, can find expressions in many different ways. You can have amuse amusement parks, art exhibitions, fairs, festivals, museums, and so on. And it's interesting to see, uh, to some extent, um, uh, the church of believers being involved in these areas. I'm not saying you find it all over the world. For example, um, 
in India, I wouldn't say there's there's there's, there's a lot. There's probably not not much or very little. Um, sometimes you may go to a church where there's like a museum, and it's okay. Here are all the you know things that remind us of the missionaries who came or the people who served here from some you know several hundred years ago, and it, it's very inspiring to go and and see this. You know, I, I I remember. When I, when I was in the in the US, uh, I went to Oral Roberts University campus, and they it, it was so amazing. They had um, I think it, I, I forget the details now, but uh, they had um, maybe it was under the prayer tarp itself. But they had this whole it's almost like you can say a, a, a kind of like a museum, but they had you know uh, pictures and other things from the beginning of how all Robert started his ministry and you know you could just walk through it and it was so inspiring to just you know walk through it see all these things like hey here was a man who was dying uh, and God healed him and God gave him a vision uh, of serving God raised him up to serve him then God gave him a vision to build a university and he built a university so just going through that museum kind of thing I was so inspiring I also remember going through I think Billy Graham uh, in North Carolina they, they have another museum uh, uh, just the life and the story of Billy Graham you know how you know and so you just walk through that museum they have all the pictures and from different things from his life and uh, you walk through it and you see and it's so inspiring it inspires you it gives you encouragement that hey this is how God works. He can take some ordinary person and you know use them to impact the world. So uh, these kinds of things, which they fall in the category of entertainment, meaning you're not like doing some big study or anything. You're just you're being relaxed. You're going. You're seeing these things. But as you walk to that museum, you get so inspired. You get so encouraged, uh, and so on. So uh, so that's just another area where we can minister. To to people, be an encouragement to people. And along those lines, there are Christian theme parks. And I, and I think it's, more, it's nice, if you get some time, you can go online and go to these websites here, in Ark Encounter, so on where in Ark Encounter, somebody has, um, this person has tried to recreate the Ark, like rebuild the entire Ark. So they actually built it. And you, know, you, you can go inside and you have like a journey, like, okay, uh, of course, we are thinking this is how it would have happened, how the animals would have been all kept inside the ark. And it's kind of like almost a real life, life size experience. You walk through the ark. And, uh, and, and of course, it's an opportunity to speak about the Lord and speak about God and uh, things of the Bible. And uh, uh, it's a learning, plus, it's a real life encounter uh, with these things. So you can, uh, it's, it's nice. Uh, same thing with the Creation Museum. So it's nice that people are doing this because, yeah, even Christians, we, we, we need some you know time to uh, relax and go out and see these things and uh, uh, relax. And then it's nice that we can go to such places and uh, at the same time be encouraged and reminded. But just to let us know that these are things that are being done in a nice way. I mean, it's not all over the world, but uh, at least in some measure, something is happening. And the last point I just want to mention is about gaming. Um, when you say gaming, we're just talking about using uh, video games or any form of uh, tech, uh, video technology uh, to create something that uh, uh, is fun. But of course, we are using it in, a, in an educational way, in a positive way. Yes, there is the wrong use of gaming, meaning uh, you know there are a lot of games that are created uh, uh, which are you know which in, you know encourage fighting and war and this that and all those kind of things. That's the wrong use, but it can also be used in a positive way, like for education, or community building, training, and so on. So I'm talking about the positive use of gaming. So even for training, for example, you want to train doctors, uh, you want to train people in other aspects they use these kinds of technology video games to simulate things so 
it's actually like you're doing it, but you're not doing it on a physical person, but it's your, it's simulated. So it's, that's how people learn. So uh, they simulate the uh, whatever they want to train them in, and uh, and it gives them experience. Now, uh, the thought here is why can't we use this uh, for uh, uh, you know uh, kingdom purposes for uh, church or ministry purposes? And there are lots of ideas, and uh, there are some people. I think you can search online. You'll find some people who are beginning to do things here. But I, 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 I truly feel that there's so much more that can be done in this space. Uh, so I'm just presenting it here, uh, something to keep in mind. And if there are people with these skills, we should encourage them. Uh, we can create some nice educational games where we teach people Bible stories in an interactive way. They can run it on their phone or their uh, computer and interact with it and learn through it. We can give them virtual tours, um, especially in you know, a Bible location and so on. So not everybody can physically get up and go you know, uh, to uh, other places, but at least they can see and kind of physically I mean, experience through video and simulation what it would have been, what it would look like uh, to go through those parts of the world. Uh, we can have interactive sermons and devotionals. So while the message is there, there could be some little, you know, answer this question, some little quiz or something like that's coming up. It's getting people to engage with the sermon or the devotional. Uh, you could have multiplayer games where four or five people are playing and it's building community. Of course, they're playing around something that's Bible based, uh, things like that. Uh, we can also use it for missions and outreach. We can create awareness of other parts of the world. Uh, what is happening in other parts of it through these short videos and presentations and give people an opportunity to think about what how will you solve the problems in other parts of the world or so on uh, similarly with worship and music bible study discipleship testimonies uh, social issues uh, apps storytelling maybe even to help people meditate in the word of god we can create something where they can listen watch and at the same time meditate in god so Right. So there are many ideas there. Uh, some people have started doing something, and, and, and there's an example in Christianity.com where you can go and like it's almost like a crossword puzzle. You play. It's a small game, but it checks, you know, just tests your knowledge about uh, certain Bible things. But people will is have fun. They'll have fun doing it, filling up the crossword. But at the same time, they're reminding themselves about uh, Bible stories and so. Uh, so. This is also another area that, that can be used. Now, one reason why I think this is important is because uh, a lot of young people uh, are being caught up in video games, especially because many of them have phones, mobile phones, mobile devices, and so on. Uh, when I say young, talking about kids and teenagers, especially, sometimes you might even see adults playing video games. <laughs> But generally, it's kids and teenagers who are so caught up, you know, they're playing something so intensely on their phone, uh, you know. And uh, and sometimes hours they can go by with them doing this. Um, of course, we don't want, it's an addiction. It can, it can become an addiction. So we should not let it become an addiction. But... If we can provide some healthy alternatives, some meaningful alternatives, so that at least they focus their attention on something meaningful or something that's educational, uh, that would be, I think, a positive thing. So uh, that's why I'm presenting it here. But we also have to be careful that uh, this should not become an addiction. It should not, it should not consume uh, people's time. Okay. So just those thoughts here on entertainment and gaming, just to be aware of what's happening in the world and. And um, something to keep in mind. Uh, let's let's see if there are any thoughts or comments from anyone in the class. Any thoughts? Any comments on this lesson ten on entertainment and gaming? I mean, do you, do you think this these these are positive things, or do you think uh, we should just stay away from any form of entertainment and any form of gaming? Uh, I'd just like to hear your thoughts. Personally, I think it's positive, and uh, I, I remember 
long back maybe maybe when i was a teenager and i saw a christian bible story kind of something i, I don't remember the names but even though i knew all the stories i still went in <laughs> and uh, it was quite exciting to see like how they have made it what what they want to say through it and all this so uh, it was nice like it was really engaging above all there's no distraction i believe <laughs> like it's not like uh, listening to a long sermon where sometimes we think of something else we are so caught up in it that's what i i feel like because there's always some shift happening change in colors something different coming up so uh, distraction can be very less i think so so i think it's it's positive and it's good for the next generation as uh, so many wrong things are coming up even in the game industry and so many things are uh, it's good if the kids have uh, access to this so that uh, they can choose the right things and they can grow up really strong in the world yeah okay thank you for sharing here yeah. it really um, holds people's attention and so engages the young people the teenagers and uh, at the same time meaningfully communicating something from god's word so it's nice uh, divya go ahead please thank you pastor uh, uh like uh, i was uh, especially thinking about young kids um uh, there were times when uh, i had uh, searched for things to uh, you know uh, safely show to my kids uh, that are biblical and that do not uh, divert from uh, the doctrines and such and it's really helpful when people do uh, you know take it up um, into uh, this level of uh, it's a ministry i would say because uh, surely parents are looking for uh, something that's safe and something that's useful for kids uh, so yeah uh, uh, one of the uh, programs that uh, my kids you uh, they still watch that even i enjoy seeing it it's super book uh, it's it's very entertaining as well as um, it really uh, brings out uh, the the bible stories in a very you know, practical way uh, so that's that's really helpful and also there are uh, lots of uh, uh the resources available um um especially for young kids um like uh, th there's even uh, 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 you might have heard of um, answers in genesis uh by ken ham so which which talks about uh, the creation story and they they have even uh, we can subscribe for their channel and they have very good programs for kids uh which really helps parents and uh, i believe um it's such a great ministry and uh, uh really people need it uh because there's so much of other things that is going on around and so difficult to always filter what just good and which is not good for the kids so yeah i yeah, just want to share thank you um thank you Oh, thank you for sharing that, Vivian. Anyone else you want to share any thoughts and experiences, any resources that, uh, that you have encountered in entertainment and gaming that is useful? Okay, fine. So with that, uh, we bring to a close, you know, this particular section of thinking of, you know, all the contemporary ways ministry is being done. Uh, we've covered a wide range of things. Now we are going to shift slightly and uh, kind of focus on, you know, on communications and uh, uh, online uh, engagement, uh, how we engage with people. Now that's also very big. Um, uh, big space, uh, big area. So we will take some time to go through this, and I'll just share with you, you know, some of our learnings, some of our experiences. Mm, uh, I'm not saying that we, you know we, we know everything. We don't. Uh, we are still learning as we go through what we're doing. Uh, but I can share with you, you know, some of the practices uh, we are using 
and we are also you know constantly uh, evolving in what we do so i'll share with you some of the things and uh, and then you know uh, yeah, i'd encourage you to explore whatever areas of interest so we're going to start off with chapter 11 uh, we're going to talk about digital communications and uh, engagement um essentially we are in this lesson particular lesson we are talking about using mm, digital communication tools and how we can engage with people i will uh, share uh, uh, these things with you and a little later we'll get into more tech you know uh, software platforms i will get into more of telling you okay what these are the platforms you're using these are the technology you're using that comes later but this one is it is kind of giving us an overview of all the communication tools. So we'll talk about websites. Uh, initially, we just start off by saying, okay, uh, we need to uh, have a strategy, how we're going to engage people. And then we'll talk about websites, email communications, messaging, uh, virtual meetings, which I think all of us are familiar with. Um, some, of, some of the content platforms where we can distribute digital content, uh, how we can use a church app, podcasts, and so on. Hmm? So, now, when we talk about you know digital communications, engaging with people digitally, like when we started off this course, we said you know uh, all of us, especially in urban cities and so on, we do spend a lot of time connected in the connected world online. You know whether uh, it may be. With, online websites, whether it's um, social media platforms, uh, whether it's messaging, you know, whatever software we use, whether it's WhatsApp or anything else, we're all, or whether it's email communications, we, all of these things have become kind of a normal part of our life. For those of us who are living in cities, now, of course, those who might be living in rural areas, maybe to a lesser extent, but definitely those of us living, you know, people in urban, people living in urban centers, it's just so much, uh, the digital world is so much a part of our lives. So it is important for us as a church, as a ministry, to think about ways in which we are going to engage people. You know, and things have changed. So example, maybe, um, 30 years ago, or yeah, 35 years ago, before internet came on the scene, we would now not be thinking about this. If, if I want to reach people, we're thinking about printing tracts, going door to door, house to house, giving tracts, doing ministry that way, reaching people that way. But in the last 30 years, so much has changed. The world has, you know, the digital world has become so much a part of our lives. We can't ignore it. We can't say, no, uh, this is not. No, 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 it is such an important part of our lives, everybody's life. And uh, so we need to start thinking, about, we need to think about, okay, how can we use all that we have in the digital world to reach people? To serve people inside the church, that means our own congregation, believers, and those outside the church, that means those who still need to be reached with the gospel. How do we, you know, how do we minister to them uh, in this digital world? Because everybody is there, they're connected, they're doing something. So uh, we need some thoughts, we need some ideas, and we need uh, to have some strategy. So general, some basic questions we should ask is, OK, inside the church, think about the congregation, the people you're ministering to. Who are they? Right? So you can say, like, oh, a lot of my people, yeah, they're all young people. So you know, just depending on the demographic, or oh, a lot of young people in the church, they are maybe on this social platform, media platform, and so on. What are their needs? You know, OK, young people are going through a lot of challenges emotionally mentally peer pressure whatever you know identify the needs you also have uh, elderly people who are lonely who are alone uh, they're at home uh, so understand the needs uh, how are they to interact digitally 
So what are these people doing? Now, which part of the digital world are they in? Uh, uh, are they comfortable? What are they comfortable using? Maybe they're comfortable with you know using certain kind of a messaging platform, or they are comfortable uh, watching things on uh, social media, so on and so forth. So, what digital channels would serve that you would use to serve these people? Uh, what are the objectives you want to achieve? Okay, we want for believers, of course, we want to strengthen them. Uh, we want to encourage them. We want to answer their questions. We want to provide them resources that they can use to help others. You know, uh, all these things you can think about. Uh, and then, so in order to achieve that, what content, what must you give to them? What pro content must you provide? How should you provide it? Or, you know, uh, these people uh, on a daily basis, if I can give them a short message for five minutes, that will be very of use to them. Or maybe, you know, if I can put all the verses on a particular topic and give to them, that will be useful, so on and so forth. So think about, you know, how can we provide this to them? And then, okay, evaluate progress, modify, and repeat. That means things are changing, so keep, keep, keep an eye how things are changing and how you need to be serving the people. So those in the congregation and those outside the church, the crowd out there in the world, um, around the church and beyond, how can you serve them? So uh, these are simple questions to ask and to think and, uh, you know, and, and, and just be, be very mindful of uh, what is happening in the digital world so that you could leverage those opportunities to serve people both inside the church and outside the church. So think about this and let, uh, this will help you and me help us uh, to develop some sort of a strategy. Now, of course, when we do things, uh, we need to evaluate progress. That means, you know, how effective are we in serving the people and, uh, and so on. So in, in doing this, uh, one is we should avoid what we you know generally we refer to as vanity metrics. That means these are numbers, but they don't really tell us they don't tell us the real picture. So, for example, uh, YouTube. If you put out a video on YouTube, well, for example, a Sunday sermon video, right? the views which you see the view count is not actually a real picture of how many people watched the sermon because the way youtube counts is if somebody watches um even 30 seconds of the video it's counted as a view but what would they have listened in 30 seconds in a 30 minute sermon nothing right so uh so just so we can't take that count, the view count, as a direct correlation of how many people were actually ministered to through the sermon. For example, if the view count had 100,000, it doesn't mean there were 100,000 people who listened to the sermon. It could be that maybe only 1,000 people actually, actually listened to the full sermon. The rest of it may have watched, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds. They just look, oh, yeah, nice. They have looked at, okay, this is such a big, you know, nice, nice, nice lights here. And they, they moved on. So that that, that count of 100,000 really is not telling us clearly whether that particular sermon, how many people that particular sermon affected, right? So we call it a vanity metric, or so how many views, likes, and comments. Now, in one sense, it gives, it does give a metric on visibility. That means, at least 100,000 people saw or came to know that there was this video. That's a correct metric. That means they knew or they had an even, you know, one second, 30 second engagement to the video. Okay. That means at least 100,000 people knew or know that there is this video exists. That's correct. But it doesn't mean 100,000 people actually listen to the show. That's a different metric. So to get that, you'll have to go into the YouTube analytics uh, and look at the duration of uh, of people who watched the video. So then that's an additional different metric. You see the duration of engagement. Oh, how many people actually stayed on this for 30 minutes? Then you'll get a correct count. Okay, 
there were 1,000 people actually watched for 30 minutes. So that means 1,000 people actually watched the sermon. View count is 100,000. 100, it was exposed to, it was presented to 100,000 people who watched it for maybe 30 seconds or whatever number of duration. But the actual number of people who watched that full sermon was this. So these are two different metrics, right? One is just what we refer to as a managing metric. It's not telling you the real picture, real story of impact. But there's a different metric that tells you the real impact, right? So uh, to evaluate progress, we should ask real questions. And we should look at the real numbers, the real metrics of the people. So uh, the real questions like, you know, okay, are we reaching people online? So how many, okay, how many people are we reaching online? How many people are responding to what we are doing? And how many people are actually connecting? So if you're looking at, OK, uh, we have tried to generate people back to connect with the church, then that's a real number. Like, how many people are actually connecting back to the church? right? Um, or if you're thinking about how effective um, uh, uh, your, your website is, and how many people are finding us online? Um, yeah, so that's a real number, uh, you, if you have that number. Uh, how many people are? Um, moving from the first step to the next step. That is, they may maybe find us online. How many of them actually come to church? How many of them actually get connected? So those are things that we should be looking at, or those are the real numbers we should be looking at. So just this, this examples. So to evaluate progress, ask real questions. Don't get trapped. Don't get fascinated or caught up by the, uh, the views or the likes or things like that, because that really is not giving us the giving us an accurate picture. Um, some examples of how we can, <laughs> sorry, some examples of how we can generate some real uh, engagement, right? So um, uh, there used to be a time when uh, uh, um, we would give, you know, when people come to vis visit a church, um, they would, and we still do. If they come physically, we tell them, please fill up a card. You know, we give them, we call it the first time business card. Yeah. But then, let's say, uh, so that is for people who come physically to church. For people who are coming online, who are seeing us online, uh, we can't give them a physical card, but maybe we can give them an ebook. I say, hey, go to our website, download this free ebook, Experiencing God or something. Then we can count how many people are actually going and downloading the book. So they'll fill up maybe and give, give us a name and email ID and download the book. So then we know, okay, that's an actual engagement. Right? We know actual count, like how many people actually came into the service. We know how many people actually did something. They went, they, uh, they entered their details and they downloaded the ebook. Uh, that's a real, you know, a good, good way uh, of online engagement. Or, um, so suppose you host, uh, we used to do, uh, let's say, seminars in-house, but now that we have online tools, conferencing tools, what if we do a webinar, like a Zoom conference or a Zoom online thing on Wednesday uh, on topics that are interest and engage people? Yeah. So then, uh, and you're talking about things that are relevant, say, for families, uh, anxieties, or whatever, sorry. Something that's relevant to the, uh, there are, uh, there's different topics here that's mentioned, or issues or matters that uh, are relevant to different segments, and you engage with people. So that's a real thing, right? Uh, 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 now you're using a digital, you're using a digital platform, like uh, uh, some online conferencing webinar tool, and you're engaging with people digitally on matters that, that they would be interested in and people are connecting. That's real. Suppose you change your website online and uh, you, uh, you create a website or you redesign your website to help people make their journey of faith. So you know, instead of just making it like, a, hey, this is who we are, this is our address and fine, but now you're doing your website in a way that I'll help you on your spiritual journey. Yeah. So that's a meaningful change uh, to engage people online. 
or you can even do a podcast on some say example just example of marriage to help people in their marriage and from there they can connect with the church that's a again another form of digital engagement you're using podcast to address a particular area of need which is for marriages and from there you're helping people connect to the church or you can even and do an online marriage program okay, called whatever retreat or whatever you can call it and uh, from there so people participate online and from there you welcome them to church yeah, so, so i mean this is just ideas which different people have tried and um, but they're using a digital platform to address a particular need, a real need, engage the people online, and from there invite them to be part of the Christian community and so on. Okay. So this example. So we can think of so when you talk about digital engagement, you know, here's some things you can just just for thinking about it. Suppose you want to create a digital engagement to target teens and young adults, like between 13 to 23. So what are some of the things we can do uh, to target teenagers and young adults? How would we go about this? So first of all, we want we want to identify digital platforms. Where are these people spending their time? Right? Are they on Instagram? Are they uh, using some other platform? I mean, whoever the, the group that target the people that you're engaging with. Are they active on some other? Uh, and so, of course, we can go online, look at uh, some data. Sometimes we're, uh, we're able to get data. Otherwise, you just ask around, hey, where are all these people? What are, what are you guys using mostly? Yeah. So then, uh, if they all are using a certain platform, then try to engage them there or on, on those few platforms that they are involved in. You engage them. And then you think about what are, the, what are their needs, therefore what is the content I'm going to create, and how am I going to release it, and so on. We'll talk more about that uh, as we go. Right? So let me just pause here for a moment. Any thoughts, any questions here on what we just talked about now? Having a strategy for digital engagement, and then to look at real numbers, to assess how effective we are. Uh, don't get caught up by you know, vanity metrics, but look at real numbers. And just gives, uh, giving us an assortment of ideas. Let me see, there's so, much, so many different things we can do to address different needs, whether it is teenagers, marriages, young couples, working professionals. There are different, different things we can do, whether you go on a webinar or podcast or uh, and engage them in their platform just to give us an introduction here any questions any comments anybody wants to make before we move forward okay all good okay so let's start Sorry about that, I was clicking on the wrong button. Uh, let's uh, break this down further. Uh, and we will talk about, we start off with the very basics, which is emails, right? So, uh, sorry, websites. We talk, start off with websites. Um, so, a website these days is almost, uh, everybody expects it. Um, now, you know, maybe some years ago, if we wanted, if we used to use brochures, printed brochures. If you want to introduce your ministry, uh, you would have a brochure, you know, and you'd give the brochure to people. Okay, this is a, you know, my address is there, and all the details are there. You will give out brochures to people to share about the church or ministry. It used to be. Uh, that's the way generally we would do it. But nowadays, um, 
you don't find too many people having doing brochures. Everybody, you know, just are expecting you to have a website. Because if they want to know more about the church or they want to know more about the ministry, uh, so what's your, what's the website? Can I go, uh, you know, read up online what you're doing, what are the people, what are the ministries you do? Uh, that's a kind of an expectation. Right? So let's talk a little bit here yeah, about uh, so having a website for your church or ministry is a useful thing. Uh, it's uh, and then in compared to printing brochures, it's it's lower cost and uh, it's available 24/7 on, uh, online. Anybody can go and access it. And so it, there's so many benefits having a website as compared to printed brochures. Right. So just some thoughts here when if, when you are considering setting up a website for your church, your ministry. Uh, usually you would use what, what we refer to as a content management system. That means you don't have to build a website from scratch. Now, of course, there are people who can help you build a website from scratch if you want to. Uh, but if you're thinking of something long term, thinking of something that's going to keep growing, uh, we would recommend using a content management website. Um, there are different uh, platforms, and these are open source. That means they are freely available. Uh, we at APC we build uh, all our websites using Joomla. We use this. Um, uh, lots of other people use WordPress. Um, we just chose Joomla because um, we felt more comfortable working with it. It had kind of things that we were looking for. Uh, WordPress is also a very very common content management system. And then there are other things, other places you can do. Uh, the advantage of using a content management system is you can just customize things. You can create set things up the way you want it. It's very easy to learn. And there are lots and lots of people who build websites using content management systems. Um, you can also use other platforms, like you mentioned, where you can just build it yourself. You can go, uh, you know, today you can go and you can set up a website on Squarespace or WordPress get whatever name you want and it's very easy to set it up now some things i just want to make uh, mention here is uh, if you are using some uh, a consultant or somebody from outside to help you do this very important make sure that you have full control over your website and platform and i remember uh, not i remember but there have been some instances where uh, another christian ministry would reach out to us and they'd say you know, we engage this developer to build our website, and now he's holding us ransom. Basically, he's not giving us the username, password, and we, you know, he's controlling us, and he can't, we can't make any changes. And you know, basically, that that developer consultant is holding this Christian organization uh, because he because he set up everything. He's got control on their website, mm, uh, and so they and they get in a difficult difficult situation. So don't let that happen. So all the login credentials, registration information, it should be in your organization's control, uh, and not give, don't hand that off to some other consultant. And if you're engaging an outside consultant, have a contract in place so that you know all responsibility is done. So be careful when you're engaging somebody from outside, even though they're believers. Sometimes they can become a little uh, yeah, unreasonable. Anyway, so. Uh, Choose a very, uh, um, uh, you know, very meaningful domain name. Uh, you may, uh, you want something short and easy to remember, uh, something that they can associate with your ministry, easy to type, uh, and uh, maybe if you're using a mnemonic, it should not be too long. So, example, you know, uh, if you, uh, if you, if the name of the church is Hope City Church in Bangalore, you'll try to see if, you know, it's you can find something like Hope City. Or HCCB, Hope City Church, Bangalore, or something like that. You know? So, for example, for, our, for us, it's all people search and world outreach. So, we just call it APCWO. Uh, it's just the mnemonic for all people search and world outreach, APCWO.org, or APC Music, or examiningjesus.com, and so on. And you can find out what domain names are available. If you go to whois.com, you enter your domain name. Uh, you can find out if it's available. And if, for a church or a ministry, you'll usually use .org as the extension. And, and uh, uh, you know, you can use other extensions. 
uh, depending on which part of the world you are. Um, then, of course, you would, um, once you register your domain name, you will want to host it somewhere. So you will use a hosting provider uh, to register your name, uh, your domain name, and also to host your website. Um, so basically, uh, and again, we don't want to get too technical here, but when somebody types in the URL of your website, uh, on the, uh, goes, you know, through the internet, it goes to a registrar, looks it up, and then from there, the DNS server says, okay, you have to go to this address, it goes to the hosting server, and then serves your content from there. So you registered it, and your name, domain name is registered on a domain name server from where people can go to your website. So uh, you would use a hosting provider. Uh, I just mentioned two, there is, there's so many all over the world. Um, you know, uh, maybe a local one will be cheaper. Um, maybe you will register your website and they will host your website for you as well. And uh, they will take care of all the details of registering your domain name and uh, making pushing it on domain name servers um just a few more thoughts so when you're building your website you need to think about uh, how you want to build it uh, what do you want to communicate through your website okay uh, maybe we'll take a break and come back on and talk about that um we'll talk about, about the building of the website some thoughts here now are you all with me so far is it uh, is it getting boring or is it getting too Uninteresting. You all with me so far? Okay. Yes, boss, is good. All right. So uh, if it's getting boring, if you're not interested, just let me know. <laughs> I don't know how much you want to get into. But these are, I'll tell you later on, I'll show you uh, in our next lecture how important this is because uh, people will find you. If you build a good website, uh, people will find you easily. Come um, show up in church because you have a good website. All right, so let's take a break. We'll come back at 11 and continue the class. Okay, thank you.